the um, note pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, GLC 30A18 and the governor's March 15th, 2020 order imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place. This meeting of the finance committee is being conducted by, via remote participation. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately ac access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Members of the public who would like to participate in the meeting via Zoom can do so by clicking the link uh, you see on the screen. Uh, Members of the public who would like to listen to this meeting while in progress may do so via telephone by dialing 1-646-558-8656 and enter the meeting ID 832-3747-3868 and then press the pound sign and press the pound sign again at the next voice prompt. Members of the public attending the meeting virtually will be allowed to make comments if they wish to do so during the portion of the hearing designated for public comment by the following steps previously noted, then press star nine on their telephone keypad or using the raise hand function on Zoom. We'll notify the meeting host that the caller wishes to speak. In the event that, the, that despite our best efforts, we are not able to provide a real-time access, we'll Hello. post a record of this meeting on the town's website as soon as we are able. So at this point in time, we'll do a roll call. Um, yeah. Myself, John Daugherty, present. Um, Teresa Manganelli. Present. Marianne Galizo. Marianne. Do you mute it? Muted. He is not. Uh, Marianne, you're present. Come back to Marianne. Uh, Michelle Kincaid. Not here. Lee Martinson. Not here. Bernie Nally. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Kevin Stokes? Here. And Jonathan Dugas? No? Okay. And then Marianne? You're muted. She is muted now. I'm asking her to unmute it. Okay. Got it. Yep. Okay. You're present, right? Yes. Okay. First order of business is a COVID-19 update. Uh, Shelly? Chief Kavanaugh? Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, I will just give you the same update that I gave the selectmen last night. We're, we're actually doing pretty good in Wilmington right now. We have 164 active positives. Uh, we're, our numbers are going down, which is, which is nice. I think it's the post holiday surge that we're seeing. Um, the, the surge has ended, I mean, was what I'm saying, the post holiday. So uh, our next big order of business is the vaccine. I, I don't have any vaccine. I'm not hiding it. I'm not hoarding it. It's just has not come to me yet. And nor has it come to any health department that I know of. We put our order in, we're just waiting. Um, I put an order in for 1500 doses. I expect to get a hundred. Um, we are still in phase one of the vaccination efforts, meaning when I get my vaccine, which I'm hoping will be next week, I still need to finish phase one, which is first responders, um, the healthcare workers, non-COVID facing healthcare workers, anyone in, in congregate care settings, anyone in those categories that haven't been vaccinated can come and get vaccinated. Uh, if I go through my 100, then the following week, I'll still continue with phase one. So I cannot move to phase two until I finish phase one. So currently right now, we've done 70 first responders. Um, they're all done, and, and that was my first batch of vaccine. So um, like I said, I'm just waiting for um, my next round. It's been really slow going. <clears throat> As, as it is everywhere. We just don't have it to give. My office is bombarded with phone calls. It's almost unmanageable, the phone calls that I'm getting all day. When, it, when are you getting vaccine? When can I be vaccinated? And I just don't have an answer for people and they, they're upset, they're angry, but I, it's, it is what it is. It's, I don't have it to give, so I can't, I can't just, can't pull up. I'm ready, I'm ready to do the clinics. They're gonna be at the Shriners. 
auditorium. They've been so gracious to lend us their facility, which is going to be great because I can stand up my clinics and I don't have to break them down, which is, which will be nice and easy for us. Um, I have plenty of volunteers on standby, nurses and clerical volunteers. It's just, we're just waiting and ready to go. So I don't know if anyone has any questions for me. Anyone have any questions uh, for Shelly or, or the chief? Um, I have a question. So did you say that all of the first responders have received the vaccine now? Uh, only the ones that signed up. So that was 70. So I do know there's a few more that have decided since then that they would like to get the shot so that um, they'll be as, my next go around. We'll reach, reach back out to both chiefs. They can put it out there um, if anyone wants, anyone in, in their department wants the vaccine and also will be out to any first responders that live in Wilmington are eligible for the vaccine. So when you um, say that you expect to maybe get 100 um, vaccines in your next shipment, do you think that this lag time is now over and that you'll be getting regular shipments every week? Or do you think this is going to continue to be a problem? I think that I'll get shipments every week, but they're only going to be minimal. So I think I'm going to get 100 doses for the next couple of weeks. And then all of a sudden, we'll see more. I put my order in every Monday, and then it, it pops in on the following week. So what we heard today was everyone that put their order in, we can expect 100 doses, even though I requested 1,500. Because I think I can do 500 a day. Three, you know, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays is what I'm planning on doing my clinics, about 500 a day. So right now I'll just do it one day a week until we get more. Anybody else have any other questions for either Shelly or the chief? Shelly, how are you doing on staffing? We're doing okay. I have a lot of people, um, volunteers for the clinics that are just waiting in the wings to get moving. My staff is doing well. I've got a lot of nurses that do contact tracing for me. Um, so I, you know, time will only tell when we start running these clinics more often, how my contact tracing will be able to be, you know, keep on going. So obviously um, that's just, I just got to wait and see. If the numbers still start dwindling, it'll be a little bit easier, but if they rise again, the, um, we'll just see how it goes. But it's been busy. So just to, as an FYI uh, to the committee, um, you know, uh, Shelly has uh, in the office um, one uh, clerical person, uh, and of course there's two in the office that you know, they're shared between Al and Shelly, but essentially one uh, clerical person and then the uh, public health nurse who typically is budgeted for 20 hours a week, but in light of the circumstances, I think she's more working, and correct me if I'm wrong, Shelly, here, but working probably more in the order of 40 or 40 plus hours a week. And then in addition to that, <clears throat> we have brought in um, uh, contract, at least, what, a couple of contract uh, nurses? Well, I have four. Four, okay. Four that are working anywhere from 10 to 20 hours a week. Tracy's averaging 50 to 60 hours a week. Kim, my clerical, has been doing some overtime, and I don't even know how many hours I work <laughs> all the time. Now, the school doesn't do their own contact tracing. Only you do that, correct, for the whole town? That's correct. I'm trying to get them on board with helping me out and doing some of their own as the clinics get up and running because uh, they really need to start doing their own. It's be so much easier. They're getting there. Are they currently yeah. doing it now? Are you trying to train them or? Yeah, they're doing, they're do, they do some of it with the staff, but they, they need a lot of um, assistance with, with contact tracing with the students, but they're, they're getting there. Okay. Slow, but they're getting there. But there's, they're willing to do it. That's not an issue, right? It's, 
Uh, or just trying to get them up well, to speed? I, I think quite frankly, that is an issue. Um, oh, okay. I've, you know, had some conversations um, and I think Shelly may have been on, on one of the conversations. Uh, we had a Zoom session here at some point in the last week or so. And my understanding is they, there's perhaps some um, collective bargaining issues that they believe that uh, they should be bargaining over this uh, uh, this ability to or this uh, practice of contact tracing or perhaps other activ uh, other functions, including uh, the, the vaccinations. So I'm not sure exactly where that stands at the moment, but uh, that it's certainly concerning to me because from my perspective, uh, you know, Shelley and her staff are pretty well maxed out trying to deal with the community. Um, and I think there's, there's definitely a need for uh, the nursing personnel in the school system to be able to respond to their, uh, their staff and students in terms of contact tracing. I absolutely agree with that. There's no reason why the school can't get on board and help out the town. And we're all in this together. Absolutely. Mm. Keith, any uh, comments or? Oh, uh, just one for uh, Shelley. Uh, okay. I assume you are, uh, you're ordering Moderna uh, mm -hmm. vaccine as opposed to Pfizer because you yeah. don't have yes. the ability for that. Correct. We're, um, all local health departments are getting Moderna vaccine, um, mainly because we don't have the capability to hold the Pfizer vaccine, which has to be held at um, sub-zero temperatures. Mm -hmm. So only really the, the hospitals and those kinds of medical facilities are getting the Pfizer. It will be all Moderna. Maybe I hear Johnson & Johnson, um, but we're not, we'll wait and see about that. Okay, thank you. Jeff, how are the expenses related to this? Uh, well, certainly uh, uh, Chief Kavanaugh can, can speak to that. Uh, uh, Chief has really been the point person uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the expenses. Uh, departments that are incurring COVID-related expenses have been directed to uh, submit those to his office on a regular basis so that we can uh, submit a request for COVID uh, or for uh, CARES Act reimbursement. Uh, and to the extent uh, CARES will not cover, then uh, we would be looking uh, for reimbursement from FEMA. Of course, FEMA, as you know, uh, it operates in a similar manner to their regular disaster relief. And typically we don't receive those funds for a couple of years, but the CARES money uh, uh, seems to be much more uh, timely in terms of their uh, responsiveness, but I'll, I'll let the chief uh, address that. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, good evening. So when this first began, uh, we were allotted through CARES uh, $2,107,825. That's our Total eligible uh, reimbursable allocation. Uh, to date, we've had uh, six hundred seventy-six thousand nine hundred forty-eight dollars and a penny has been reimbursed uh, to the town or requested for reimbursement. Uh, round one, which was the very beginning, so it was uh, from the onset to June thirty, was uh, three hundred fifteen thousand nine hundred eighty-two. Uh, that's already been reimbursed. We were also given uh, in round two, which went up to the beginning of September, was uh, $357,089. There was an additional uh, $3,877.01 for election postage, which we were reimbursed for. Uh, so the remaining amount right now that we are eligible to, uh, to request is $1,434,754. What's been going on is uh, the it quarterly for CARES. Uh, now CARES has been extended until the end of uh, 2021. If you remember correctly, it was supposed to end uh, the end of 2020. It was extended to the end of 2021. The FEMA project is, uh, is still indefinite. So one of the biggest hurdles that we've had, uh, and I, I can, Rebecca Sanderson, who's uh, my senior clerk, has been doing 
a hundred percent of legwork on the, on the inputting and uh, really kind of staying up on all the little nuances is that the, the FEMA end of this is changing. And so is the CARES end as to what we're actually eligible for. And, and we actually got an email again uh, last night that uh, due to the new administration, there was going to be additional changes to what is eligible and what is not. So right now we're keeping our eye on that. Um, the, now the manager had asked me to kind of give a breakdown by department. We really haven't been doing that because the way they have us categorizing things is by you know, cleaning supplies, PPE, things of that nature. So that's really how we've had it uh, categorized. Personnel costs, uh, we've been categorizing them with that as well. So, I mean, the fire department alone, uh, I can say we've we've had a, a good chunk of our uh, our overtime that we have put in for as, uh, as eligible because had we not had COVID and had the shutdown with the academy, we would have uh, essentially had spots filled that we're now currently filling with overtime. So uh, I do check with the manager, but we have been trying to uh, go about it at every angle that we can to make sure that we're maximizing our benefit here. And I think as, as we go forward, um, you know, George in public buildings has put in quite a bit for air purifiers for all the public buildings and schools. I know the schools also was running a, a grant through DESE. Uh, so right now, uh, our next round is due on um, February 26th is our next round of um, for CARES anyway, to input in and then wait for reimbursement. But like the manager said, we're, we're running probably say about a month to six weeks. We've been getting a return on uh, once we put things in. So, and, and as we're putting them in, they're doing uh, rolling reconciliations as well. So unlike a FEMA grant, uh, or I'm sorry, a FEMA project, I should say, we'll, we'll wait until the very end. They give us an end date. We have so many days to put it in. Then they look it over. They kind of kick paperwork back and forth. And then the money comes whenever they feel like cutting a check. Uh, CARES has been, uh, we've been putting them in quarterly. They've been ending um, their rounds or phases at certain intervals. And then as we uh, get the money back for the round previous, they're, uh, they're starting to reconcile that previous round while the other round is getting paid out. So lots and lots of moving parts going on here, but we are doing our best to keep up with it. We're getting... Uh, emails every day about you know different programs that FEMA is running for vaccinations and stuff like that. I keep in close contact with Shelly about those things. Uh, so doing the best we can. Uh, the department has been great with getting us in paperwork, and um, you know just keep pushing on from here and, and trying to do the best we can to get uh, every cent back that uh, that we are eligible for and entitled to. Thank you. Any right, questions so from? John, uh, John, I was just going to note, in addition to those funds from the CARES Act, uh, I did ask Paul Ruggiero uh, at the school department to uh, provide me with information about the funding that they have been uh, eligible for. And they have um, uh, several different grants here, one being the uh, Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund. Uh, they've uh, received uh, are eligible for a total of $100,660 uh, as of 121, uh, they have spent and encumbered $10,099.99 uh, and then received that um, amount back uh, through uh, 121. And this is, uh, covers PPE items purchased by the Abundant Life and he notes uh, we are required to give Abundant Life uh, the per student allowance for Wilmington students who attend the schools and a portion of the cost for Chromebooks. So that's one program they've uh, received funding for. Uh, there's also an, another program called uh, CURF uh, School Reopening Grant or Coronavirus Relief Fund. Uh, they have um, are eligible for $723,600. Uh, through 121, uh, they have spent or encumbered $508,179.59. Uh, and these funds, um, and they've actually received back uh, to date uh, 487,953. 
uh, the current sp uh, spent and encumbered balances include costs for air purifiers, filters, environmental assessments such as air quality and air exchange testing, technology purchases for Chromebooks, document cameras and remote learning licenses, including software and stipends, paid to staff for curriculum development and training related to remote uh, instruction, amongst other things. Uh, and then there's a third grant, uh, the fiscal 2021 remote learning technology essentials. Uh, this grant amount was for $39,366 uh, and they fully encumbered and received those uh, funds. Uh, so I think that's uh, actually, and then there's one other category here, um, FY21 local appropriation. Uh, this is uh, this other category is just general uh, uh, amounts that they've incurred. Uh, uh, 268,779.83 is, is the amount on that. Uh, this is for PPE and other pandemic related items. Uh, purchased initially through local appropriation. Okay. Uh, can we get a copy of that, Jeff, what you just read off? Sent to sure. Us? Thank you. Yes, I'll uh, email it to uh, uh, Christine. Thank you. Thank you. Anyway, you have any questions for either the chief or the Fischelli? i just like to thank them for all their hard work and their staff. They're doing an outstanding job. Tom really Absolutely. appreciates it. That's for sure. That is for sure. So, you know, I'd, like to, I'd like to second that and um, also add that I have a lot of confidence that um, with the people working in Wilmington, especially you, Shelley, and, and Chief Kavanaugh, that um, we're going to be okay in Wilmington. You are inspiring a lot of confidence in this process. So thank you for all your long hours. We appreciate thank it. Thank you. And, and your staff, too. Mm -hmm. yeah, they've been great uh, thank you guys thank you I appreciate uh, your being in on the meeting tonight that's for sure thank you um so you no more questions then jeff do you want to start with a um, recap of update on fiscal year 21 uh sure so just before we do that did you want to uh, i see on your agenda you have public comments did you want to go to public comments before you yeah, go do we have to any um, John, do we have any public uh, comments? In? We currently do not have any public participants. Okay, great. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You. <clears throat> uh, okay, so just uh, what I thought I would do is start with a general overview. Uh, I suspect some of you may have seen last night's presentation, so I won't go through the full uh, version of that. Uh, we'll just highlight uh, some of the key points, and then uh, what I'd like to do is uh, turn it over to uh, Brian Perry, the finance director, and he'll uh, take the, the committee through uh, the budget book uh, in, in terms of some of the pages that we'll be covering this evening. So uh, first of all, I think it's uh, the, the main, one main key point is that the overall uh, operating budget is proposed to increase by uh, less than 0.5% uh, or 0.46% or is the total uh, the fiscal year uh, 21 uh, budget is uh, 119,306,362. Uh, the proposed budget is uh, 119,852,135, the difference being 545,773. Uh, and if you look, if you have a copy of the uh, budget book and you turn to uh, page Two, you'll see the major categories uh, that uh, make up the, uh, the budget, uh, principally being the Wilmington schools. Uh, their budget is increasing uh, by 2.5%, and the vast majority of that uh, is due to salary uh, increases. 1,023,000 in changes due to salary increases. Uh, shared costs is the next major category is actually decreasing by 4.56% uh, and shared uh, costs include everything from the OPEB uh, amounts that we uh, contribute to uh, some of the statutory charges uh, that uh, we get from the state. Uh, also includes insurance uh, and those types of costs. So that is going down by a, 
fairly significant margin. Uh, general government, uh, which includes all of the town uh, services departments, is uh, slated to go up by 2.16%. And then the Shashin Tech uh, percentage-wise has the largest increase, 12.81%. Uh, I would note that that is a pre preliminary number. Uh, I had a conversation with Brad Jackson, uh, the superintendent, a couple of weeks ago, uh, and he indicated that uh, they're expecting Wilmington's enrollment to increase by about 30 students uh, from the 246 that they had as of 12-1. Uh, and so that is largely driven by the student enrollment. Uh, once he uh, has a finalized uh, budget and his school committee uh, signs off, then I'll, uh, we'll get an update on that number. Uh, so in terms of the uh, overall cost drivers, so to speak, um, the uh, uh, wages is clearly uh, a major category in terms of uh, upward pressure, so to speak. Uh, we have uh, two contracts that are settled, one with the patrol, one with dispatch. Uh, we're in the third year of those contracts. Uh, we have tentative agreements with a couple of the unions, uh, the ASME 2 and police superiors. Uh, we're in bargaining with the uh, fire uh, union, and we're also uh, have not started bargaining, but we'll be bargaining with the uh, custodial and building maintenance folks because their contract expires as of 6.30. Uh, so in, in insurance is another uh, major, uh, we're seeing some major increases in that category. Uh, health insurance, not specifically, uh, although Kerry will talk about that a little bit later, but uh, some of the other categories are increasing there. Uh, and, and then also uh, we're seeing uh, some increases in terms of uh, technology, uh, which is part of the process at this point. One of the things with technology, as you know, is you, it becomes embedded in your systems and you become so dependent on it. And there's oftentimes you need to change out equipment and so on to um, make sure that uh, you have reliable uh, programs. On the other side of the equation, uh, in terms of savings, one of the major categories of savings uh, is the borrowing. And uh, uh, we're, we're gonna see some fairly significant savings on the borrowing side. And, and Brian can speak to that a bit later. Uh, trash and recycling collection, uh, there's a uh, reduction there of 162,000 and change. Uh, that is uh, in large part because when we switched over from Russell to uh, Casella, initially uh, we had to rent uh, vehicles uh, because the trucks that we had uh, for our service contract were on order. And so that rental cost is no longer uh, we're no longer uh, being required or will no longer be required to pay that because we have uh, the trucks that are slated for our contract. Uh, also, uh, heating fuel, uh, George is projecting a decrease there of about 106,000. Um, the assessing office, and Karen can speak to this when she gets to her budget, uh, but we're seeing almost a uh, $100,000 drop in, in that budget. Uh, legal services, um, uh, projecting a decrease there of, of fifty thousand uh, dollars, and then we're also, in spite of the fact that we are uh, doing some capital investment, we're not doing as much this year uh, as we did in uh, in last year's budget. So uh, those are the principal offsets, if you will. Um, so generally speaking, in terms of our revenue, as you know, the principal means. Uh, uh, Source of revenue is the uh, property tax, and we're going up the two and a half percent plus the um, uh, the new growth. Uh, again, Brian will speak to that in more detail. Um, we are seeing, we're expecting to see some uh, decreases there, and potentially in local aid. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, I talked about last night that you know, is noteworthy in terms of the budget is we have sitting on the horizon a number of major building projects. Uh, as those of you who have participated in the procurement for an OPM, uh, we, I recently uh, signed a contract with P3, which is a owner's project manager uh, out of Nor uh, Norwell. 
and they are going to be working with us on the senior center project. Uh, and the o OPM is essentially the uh, town's representative uh, in dealing with the architects and ultimately uh, contractors if we get to that point for construction. So the first major step uh, for the OPM is uh, working with us to get a, uh, an architect or designer that will help us uh, to identify a site for a senior center and then develop the schematic design for that, um, that work. And the our RFQ, Request for Qualifications, is out on that. And I believe the deadline is early February. I think it may be February 5th, if I recall, but it's coming up. Uh, on the uh, town school uh, admin building side, uh, the committee that was in place to um, uh, make a recommendation there, uh, put forward their recommendation, uh, it turns out uh, is P3, uh, and I'm uh, expecting a proposal, price proposal from P3 uh, any day, uh, and we'll, I'll be working with them to hopefully finalize that, and then they'll be going through a similar process of issuing a, a request for qualifications on our behalf to hire an architect. So that whole process is unfolding. You know, the expectation is within the next 18 to 24 months, um, we'll be in a position to go back to town meeting uh, with a recommendation for uh, the actual construction cost on, on both of those projects. Uh, the other project that is kind of out there in, um, in waiting, so to speak, but is still a major priority is a substation. Uh, that's been a bit of a challenge in terms of locating a, um, a spot in, uh, in North Wilmington. Uh, we have been talking to a couple of parties and are focused on one particular party uh, at the moment, um, but we don't have anything definite at this point. So the first step clearly is to identify a site that is going to be suitable for a substation. And once we can get that locked down, then we can pursue uh, funding for uh, the design. Um, the other uh, element in terms of buildings is the elementary schools. Uh, so you recall in May of this past year, uh, the school superintendent, uh, Paul Ruggiero, the assistant uh, director of uh, superintendent of administration and finance, uh, George and myself uh, worked uh, on putting together statements of interest uh, which is a, a document that was sent off to the Mass School Business Authority. <clears throat> we actually submitted uh, six statements of interest, one for each of the elementary schools with the focus on the Wildwood uh, Early Childhood Center. Uh, and we are waiting to uh, hear whether we will have the opportunity to be invited into that program. Uh, if we do similar to what was done with the high school, uh, the state would provide uh, some funding towards uh, the school. Uh, so in addition to clearly the focus being Wildwood, uh, we also, uh, I think, need to be looking at the other schools as well uh, as the, um, the facilities plan talked about uh, there. At the time, there was a recommendation of consolidation. Um, it's not clear to me exactly where the school committee is on that, but it seems to me that beyond just focusing on the Wildwood, uh, there needs to be more of an integrated and comprehensive approach to how uh, the six elementary schools are gonna be dealt with. So we're expecting here in the next few weeks to hear about uh, MSBA. But when you look at that, so you know, get at least the Wildwood as one of six schools, plus potentially a fire substation, and then the senior center, and then a town school admin building. So I know there's oftentimes um, people Kind of look askance at the amount of money that we have set aside in reserves, but <clears throat> that money is 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 there to begin to help us with uh, some of these projects. So, just wanted to put that out there. Um, <clears throat> and then, in terms of some of the big ticket items this year uh, for capital, um, first on the docket or largest, uh, most expensive item, uh, we're looking at five hundred twenty-seven thousand. Uh, to replace uh, tiles, ceiling tiles at the Woburn Street School. Uh, these tiles are, um, uh, have asbestos containing material. It's all encapsulated, so it's not uh, a risk to the uh, building occupants. But uh, similar to what we did last year, 
at the West, uh, George uh, had proposed this, uh, and he can talk more in detail about that when his budget comes up. Uh, but that's 527,000. Uh, we're looking for $450,000, which is the second phase of an up, of a, uh, upgrade to our uh, communication system at the dispatch for police and fire and dispatch. Uh, and certainly Bill Cavanaugh and uh, Joe Desmond can speak in more detail about the particulars there. Uh, $365,000 uh, is planned for paying off the Russell disposal a loan, if you will, uh, that we have. So when we first entered the contract with Russell, it was uh, planned to be a 10-year contract for trash and recycling. Uh, this was the first time we went to curbside collection. So we needed to supply uh, collection uh, bins, uh, collection barrels for trash and recycling to all households in Wilmington. Uh, so at the time we opted to uh, to extend or to um, spread that uh, cost out over 10 years. Uh, then last year, of course, we received word from Russell that they were looking to terminate the contract, um, which ultimately took place. Uh, at the time, they allowed us to continue on this payment plan, but in looking at it more closely, we decided it was in our best interest to just pay it off, and ultimately that'll save us about $45,000 over the next four years. So we're looking for 365 there. I would note in each of these, the 527, the 450, and the 365, uh, the plan would be to take those funds from free cash. Uh, and then the next item as well, 350,000, uh, uh, we're looking to resurface uh, the Shashin School uh, Courts. Uh, the engineering was done on it last year. Uh, there's been a lot of cracking. Uh, it has been sealed, the surfaces have been sealed, but at this point, the, the um, uh, the court itself needs to be regraded and, uh, and, and resurfaced. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the plan is to change the uh, composition a bit. So right now there are three tennis courts and one basketball court, and the plan going forward would be to have uh, two tennis courts and two basketball co uh, courts. Uh, then we're looking at 235000 to replace a DPW excavator. It's a 2000 uh, It's kind of running out of steam at this point. Uh, again, that would be proposed for uh, payment from free cash. $175,000 uh, to add a sidewalk plow. This would be our third sidewalk plow. And again, DPW, when we get to that point, they can talk about it, but our sidewalk network is, is expanding and we wanna make sure we have the ability to clear snow when we do get it. Uh, then we have $150,000 uh, slated for a, a fire pumper. Uh, this is a refurbished fire pumper and, uh, and the Chief Kavanaugh can speak to that when, when the time comes. Um, I also wanna bring your attention to, if you're looking in the budget message, uh, it would be uh, page nine. There's a chart there um, that references funding source and expenditures for the various capital items. And if you look at the tax levy number and the free cash number, those numbers actually need to flip. So the true uh, tax levy number should be the 1,042,500 and the free cash number should be 2,252,000. Um, unfortunately, I didn't catch that before it went off to print, but just wanted to bring your attention to that. Um, also wanted to just mention uh, the uh, good work that uh, a number of people on this call uh, were involved in, certainly Brian um, and uh, Carrie, uh, Pam and uh, uh, Karen, uh, as well as Valerie Gingrich. Uh, we uh, were, were looking at uh, refinancing the high school debt uh, and as part of that effort, uh, we had to go to S&P and be reevaluated in terms of our bond rating. Uh, that took place in May. Of course, you know, timing is everything. And unfortunately in, in May, if you recall, the economy was starting to slide. Um, and that was one of the items that I, I think S&P, at least in part, expressed some concern about, but given what they saw and what we were able to present to them in terms of our discipline at putting money away in terms of reserves and uh, our 
conservative approach to budgeting, uh, we retained our AA plus. So I think uh, as much as I would have liked to have gotten the AAA, um, given the circumstances, I think we, uh, we were, were, were still in a good place. So, um, and not to mention, and, and Brian will talk about this, but we were able to save some money on, our, uh, on the high school borrowing. Uh, personnel, uh, this is, uh, you know, I indicated to departments going in, uh, and I think everybody understood it, that this was going to be a, a tight year and that personnel were not going to be, uh, personnel ads anyways, were not likely to happen. But there are two positions that I'm recommending to add, one being a police sergeant uh, and the other being a relief custodian. Uh, and we can talk more in detail when those departments uh, come up uh, to discuss that. Um, and then I would just note, uh, well, so one of, the, one of the issues that we will be talking about, I'm sure, when, when the budgets, uh, these particular budgets come up, uh, is the uh, significant increase that you will see in overtime for the fire department uh, and for dispatch. Um, and without going into all the details, as the chief alluded to earlier, uh, uh, Chief Kavanaugh, we have really been hamstrung uh, in terms of the ability to fill the positions that were authorized at town meeting. Uh, part of it being COVID, uh, the academies were shut down uh, for a stretch of time. Uh, we've had uh, individuals who have started uh, into the process and then not been able to complete it. Um, there's just been a number of circumstances there that have really um, created some challenges for us. So as a result, we're not fully staffed. And of course, we've also had some COVID incidents uh, with uh, staff at the fire department, uh, which have further generated over time. Uh, and we're hoping to see some relief here uh, in the next couple of months. Uh, one of the things we need uh, in order to move forward is a new civil service list uh, that has EMTs on the list. Uh, and the chief is being told that a new civil service list is forthcoming in March. So um, once that, if, if in fact that happens, we'll be able to pull people off of that list and begin the, uh, the uh, recruiting process uh, for some additional people. Uh, on the dispatch side, as you recall, uh, the finance committee supported and ultimately the town meeting supported a, an additional uh, position there. Uh, again, we've really been struggling uh, to fill those positions. Uh, we've had instances where we'll bring uh, people in uh, and then <clears throat> partway through the process, they uh, decide it isn't for them. Or then in some cases we've had where we uh, bring people through and then get them trained and they're kind of in the um, co-pilot seat, if you will, just getting the final training and then they decide it's really not what they thought it was and they, they resign. Uh, we've also have, which has been the case for years, uh, instances where uh, people sign up for dispatch with the long-term goal of being a police officer or firefighter. We had two individuals this year that, <clears throat> um, you know, certainly good for them, uh, ultimately became firefighters, but Long and the short of it is it becomes a bit of a revolving door in terms of uh, trying to keep uh, people in those spots. Um, we don't tend to get people uh, from other dispatch centers with experience. So more often than not, what we're seeing is people coming into these positions that really have no uh, public safety background whatsoever. Um, they're thinking it might be something that they'd be interested in. And so that can sometimes be challenging. So. Uh, we can talk more about that when those departments come up, but just to let you know that that's, you're gonna see big increases in overtime there. Um, the other thing, just uh, kind of somewhat separate, but in terms of uh, general operations, uh, as you may know, we're still operating uh, here at the town hall in a kind of a remote mode. So fortunately, the one virtue of this building is it is primed for drive up service. So all the windows are still open. You can get a hot coffee and a smile. Um, but you know, if we've been fortunate from the, a weather standpoint because other than tonight, we haven't really had the snow to contend with. So people are still driving up to the windows and you know, we haven't really heard a whole lot of negative feedback. I, I haven't heard much at all, quite frankly. I think people are getting used to it uh, we, we do have people on a rotating basis, so some people are working from home to the extent they can. Uh, other people 
uh, can't work from home. Unfortunately, for example, in the treasurer collector's office, we certainly don't want uh, people um, you know, transacting money, for, uh, making money transactions from home. So uh, all PM staff is here at the town hall, and uh, but we're using all the spaces at the auditorium. Uh, we have two people in there from the treasurer collector's office. We're using room nine for uh, office space. We're using the um, one of the offices used to be community development. So we're spreading people out to the fullest extent possible, you know, with the premise that we don't hopefully uh, want to be in a situation where a whole department gets shut down because uh, someone gets exposed and then passes it on. So, and then similarly, library, as, as you know, uh, they have not, uh, their curbside uh, pick up and drop off uh, in the senior center as well. So we're staying in that mode for the moment. And hopefully if, if the numbers keep going in the right direction, we'll be at a point here in the next few months where we can uh, perhaps return to normal. So um, with that, I'm gonna ask, uh, unless there's any questions, I'll, I'd ask Brian to um, uh, take the finance committee uh, through the next pages here, starting with page one. Jeff, can I ask a question? Sure. With uh, with a lot that you know, obviously has been experienced over the last year. What have you seen in terms of website traffic for, for online transactions? Has it been an opportunity to leverage the website more and push more uh, transactions and um, intentions out to the website? Have, has that provided any value uh, offset some of the challenges of coming into the office? Uh, Pam, can you can you speak to a uh, Pam or Brian uh, uh, to uh, what you've seen in terms of uh, transactions, you know, is it greater than normal uh, in terms of payments? I would say it is. Um, you know, people have been really wonderful about it. You know, we tell them all the options available um, to pay their bills. Uh, and I, I think they're realizing how easy it actually is. So they can pay their water, their excise, their real estate um, bills online. So, or they just come to town hall and drop their payment in the box. Um, so we haven't had a lot of pushback on it. Um, I think it's been a positive experience and I think more people are utilizing it. Um, the town clerk uses the online services too uh, for um, certain vitals and dog licenses. So I, I, you know, I see the volume on their side as well as, uh, you know, a lot of people use it for that as well. Sorry, I didn't get any of that. I don't know. Kevin, you Kevin, you're coming through garbled. I don't know. There is a, Jeff, there is a monthly report too that um, John O'Neill provides that shows a, a lot of the activity. I know our office uh, has a lot of people visiting the website to research information, get applications, um, and it's been very helpful. But John does have a report that's um, quite helpful. Right. During, yeah, no, John, my, you... during my presentation, I'll um, make sure I have uh, website uh, statistics for you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Brian. All right, thank you, Jeff. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, board. Um, as Jeff mentioned, there's a lot of challenges we have in trying to put together this budget, uh, given a, a lot of other, a lot of very different issues that we, um, we didn't plan on at this time last year. So what I'll do is, if you don't mind, I'll step you through um, the budget book here. We'll start with our revenues. And what we'll do is we'll start on page one once we get through the messages, through the Roman numerals and on the on the real actual numbers here. So if we start taking a look at available funds here, what this is, is this is a high level snapshot of basically all the sources of revenue that we have for the operating budget. Um, we have listed the actuals from FY19, the actuals from FY20, and then we have the initial manager's budget from last year at this time. This is the pre-COVID budget. And then the revised estimate for 21 is what we had pulled together um, last May to deal with the challenges and assumptions we had on the revenue end. And then on the far right-hand side is our estimate or our, our budget for FY22. 
what we do is we'll talk, we'll take a look at all the sources basically in a minute, uh, step by step, and uh, kind of the nuts and bolts as to what makes it up. Uh, but first off, the tax levy. This is typically or annually voted at a two and a half percent increase is, is why you see it stepping up as it does um, dollar, by, dollar figure wise. And what this is, this is residential, commercial, industrial, uh, real estate, as well as personal property collections. The next line item is for local receipts. This is um, the main, the biggest piece of this is motor vehicle excise. This also includes fees, fines, license permits, those type of things as Pam even just briefly alluded to that are uh, collected at town hall or other various town offices. The local receipts for the sewer is the user charges for the sewer. When that was part of the general fund, uh, that money had been received and had been allocated essentially as part of the operations for the sewer. In FY21, as of this year, it's its own standalone enterprise fund. So we at least keep the numbers in there for historical reference, but moving forward, we can't count on them as part of our operating budget because they're allocated to its own enterprise fund. For local aid, that's our state aid. That's what we get from the state. Uh, we had all sorts of challenges last year trying to figure out what was gonna happen once COVID hit. Um, we have a little bit more um, information as to how the state has um, spent money, how they had to tap into a lot of their rainy day, one-time um, sources of funding to help essentially balance their budget for FY21, which historically will start passing through the house um, around May, June, and then it's typically finished beginning of July. As you may know, it was FY21 budget was passed formally, I believe, um, mid-December or so. So that was one of the challenges too, is when we're working on trying to put together figures for the next fiscal year, um, and we're still not even quite sure what they have finalized for the current year that we're operating under. Free cash is what we had voted to appropriate um, and use as a source of funding. Uh, the past few years, it's been used to either fund some of the stabilization accounts, uh, namely the capital stabilization, um, or it's also used to help fund capital article from the capital improvement plan that Jeff had alluded to about 10 minutes ago. We'll talk a little bit more about that and how the budget structured in FY22 solely just to fund capital improvement articles. The indirect charges available funds historically has just been listed as water. Um, we had to actually expand that with sewer uh, being its own enterprise. And what this is, this is basically funds that aren't under the general fund, paying the general fund back for charges that are paid out of the general fund, such as insurance, benefits, those type of pieces that are paid from the general fund that are essentially needing to be charged off to the other standalone funds. And that's basically how we account for that. And that's the line item there, so it's a little bit more broad where it doesn't strictly encapsulate just the water fund. The last two that we actually have funding in is sale of cemetery lots and the cemetery trust fund. This is historically gone, um, been voted to appropriate 20,000 from each of those that go directly to helping the upkeep of the, of the cemetery and nothing's changing on those lines. We also have um, potentially for future items, a capital stabilization fund we haven't drawn from that yet. Uh, but as Jeff mentioned again, is on the horizon, there are some pretty sizable capital projects coming up. And at some point we're gonna to have to start um, coming up with how we're gonna start funding and paying for these projects, whether it's a combination of free cash, um, funding from the stabilization fund, uh, borrowing any sort of those combinations, but there's, um, that's a discussion for a different day. We also have listed at some point, if we ever need to draw on surplus from the allowance for abatements, or if we ever have funding from capital projects closing out that we, we want to bank on as part of the revenues, but for the time being, we don't need to really see that as an option. And that's why they're not included in the budget. Moving on to page two, it's strictly just a visual representation of how the sources of funding break down by category. Um, as every year, the tax levy is a large piece of how we fund our operating budget. Uh, the local receipts, local aid are the next two biggest pieces. And then the other available funds is a makeup of the free cash and a lot of the indirect charges. And that had actually went down a little bit. And what we'll do is if you want to move on to page three, we can take a little bit deeper dive onto those. Page three is the annual um, changes basically for 
the available funds for our sources of revenue here. So what we have is our actuals as of June 30th of 2020. We have the appropriated budget from town meeting from last spring. And then we have our FY22 proposed budget in here. So this has given us a snapshot of basically how these sources have progressed over the past couple of fiscal years. Uh, as I noted before, the tax levy typically increases by two and a half percent. There's a couple other factors in there um, that help raise it. Um, new growth, we'll get into that in a little bit more. That's typically budgeted at 1.1 million and it's beat that figure the last couple of years. We also have excluded debt that's added on as well here. Uh, we can talk about that briefly in a minute as well. But as you notice, the the tax levy has increased about three million and changed the last couple of years, and that's a byproduct of the increase of the two and a half percent. The local receipts has been scaled back over the past couple of years. Um, one of the things that Jeff had mentioned too is the town policy is to conservatively budget uh, the revenues, project what is reasonably anticipated um, that you'd receive. So as we look into the local receipts as FY20 was a pretty sizable figure compared to what we had budgeted for 21, as well as for FY22. Um, we had the figure inflated a little bit in FY20 as a couple non-recurring items that we had received. Um, in FY22, we don't simply bank on getting year in and year out. One of those is we got reimbursed right before the last spring for the March of 2018 snowstorm that FEMA had covered us for, um, for certain expenses. So that took about two plus years to get funding or reimbursement from FEMA. That's not part of our operating budget, but that helped inflate our local receipts. We had a, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, there's also some non-recurring um, sources of revenue that we do receive. We don't, we don't bank on that, such as the Medicare drug subsidy. We also had, um, as far as payments in lieu of taxes go, typically we get two payments a year from Reading a Light District. In FY19, the payment that we typically get at the end of the year in June had come in late into July. So we had on the books in FY20, uh, three of those payments. So that's why when we go in a couple of pages, when we look at local receipts, you'll see why um, payment in lieu of taxes is seemingly much higher than it's been projected um, for the actuals. The other thing I just want to touch on too was the free cash. In FY20, we used about $4.7 million of free cash. Four million of that was to help start funding or help continue to fund the capital stabilization account, well, 751,000 of that went to capital projects. So if we look at the budget this year, 2.2 uh, million of it uh, is included from free cash. That is 100% going to capital articles. It's not being used to help continue to fund the stabilization in FY22. And then moving forward onto page four, this is just another representation again of the funding sources how they compare over prior years, and it also includes the percentage. These are the figures that tie back to the, the pie chart from page two. It's showing that we had increased our tax levy um, as a percentage of our budget by about 2% more than we had, had leaned on it before in the past. This is a byproduct in part of not using, I guess the two biggest pieces, local receipt, the local aid has not been continuing to climb. We've been having challenges in trying to project any sort of growth there. I believe that as actually tomorrow, I know Karen had mentioned it earlier too, and Jeff and I had talked about it earlier, is we believe that at least the governor plans on releasing his initial budget tomorrow. That might give us some sort of guidepost, but that's also still subject to, as you guys know, um, some significant scrutiny through the house and Senate before the, uh, the final budget is released and that will still be a ways away and there's still a lot to happen as far as uh, state funding and state expenses go before we really know what we're gonna end up with there. Moving on to page five, this is a look at the tax levy comparison. And what this does is the, the top part of this, this is showing the town's levy limit. This is with the 2%, the sorry, the, excuse me, the 2.5% increase off of uh, the base 
for our levy capacity. It also shows the new growth. It shows that in FY21, we had budgeted as we consistently have 1.1 million in new growth. In FY20, we had 1.8 million. In FY21, we had about 1.3 million. A lot of the new growth we had seen is to some degree drying up. Karen can talk to that a little bit later if we need to, uh, but we still do believe at least for 22 that we still should reasonably assume or expect that we can get right around 1.1 as we've budgeted in the past. The debt exclusion is essentially the excluded debt from the high school project. Typically this starts to drop off about 80 to 85,000 a year, but if you notice in FY22, it's a much bigger drop off. Uh, this is strictly because of the excluded debt is, uh, is tied to our debt service on the high school project. The debt and interest that we'll talk about in a couple of minutes has been greatly reduced from the refunding we had done on the high school debt. It realized a pretty significant savings for the town and we can talk to that in a couple of minutes. Pages six and seven, um, for, for those board members who happen to be listening and for Karen, um, these are slides, these are numbers that we had shown to the board in November when we're having the tax rate certified and voted. Uh, this is just a quick comparison on page six of where the residential tax rate per thousand evaluation is for the town of Wilmington and where it ranks. And it also shows the average single family house value and where it stacks up in other, uh, other comparable towns in, in Middlesex County. Page seven is gonna show us how the classification goes when you break it down between residential and then the split for commercial, industrial, and personal property. And then it just shows at least how the valuations break down and how they tie out to the actual taxation. If anyone has questions too, if you guys need to jump in, you're obviously more than welcome to. Otherwise, I'm just gonna keep going ahead and I'm gonna talk about page eight here, which is local receipts. On local receipts, uh, as mentioned before, the biggest factor here is the motor vehicle excise. We've seen a slight drop off or a slight slowdown, at least as far as collections go on the motor vehicle excise side of things. We had it, we had it budgeted 4.8 last year and we ended up collecting uh, about 4.5 million basically. Just looking through our commitments for FY21 currently and the big commitment going out in the near future is basically trending to around 4.5 six is the number that we're comfortable with and we feel is reasonable to continue to move ahead for our figure on motor vehicle excise. The vast majority of local receipts beyond that are pretty consistently budgeted as year over year. The one that does jump out is charges for service for ambulance. Uh, this is, as far as receipts and collections go from ambulance, there was a pretty noticeable drop off last spring in our collections. We've typically been pulling in around 700 or so, uh, 700,000 for receipts for the year. Our collections in the last four months or so of FY20 uh, were significantly impacted by the pandemic. Uh, we, we brought in 536,000, which was well below our estimates. We wanted to try and bring that projection in line. Um, just jumping up a little bit more um, on the chart, uh, local meals tax. We didn't know how to, we, we had some challenges trying to project a figure last year with the shutdowns going on last spring and how drastically that would impact collection. So we had actually reduced the local meals tax projection to 200,000. Through the collections we've seen year to date, it's, it's been trending right around 300, 300 plus for collections for the year for FY21. So we were comfortable in at least increasing the projection for FY22 to 300,000. I also did touch on payment in lieu and taxes is we typically collect about 800 to 850,000 annually in pilot payments. FY20 was just abnormally high because we had received an additional one that should have been applied to FY19. So if we look back, FY19 was off by about 400,000. FY20 was high by about 400,000. So we're trying to just smooth that out moving forward. And I believe we have done that. Otherwise, you'll also see towards the bottom some of the miscellaneous non-recurring items I touched upon that we just can't reasonably bank on planning and assuming we're going to collect 
year over year. And that's really the bottom line as to how we look at the figure that we have of the 8.7 million, uh, which is a slight decrease from the 9 million that we had projected for FY21. Moving forward to page nine, it's a little bit of uh, detail that we have on the local aid. We had projected last year before town meeting that we would be looking at potentially a decrease of 5% to the chapter 70, this is the school funding essentially, and a 15% decrease to the unrestricted general government aid. The state revenues have started to trend up a little bit better in the, in the, in the past couple of months, uh, but we do know that they had pulled a lot of levers to essentially level fund the budget with the thought being that potentially 22 might be a little bit worse. We're still not really sure about where everything's gonna stand um, in FY22. So we just wanted to be consistent with the budget we presented last year. Uh, so what we did is we had assumed, again, a 5% decrease to chapter 70 and the 15% decrease to the unrestricted general government aid. Otherwise, we're looking to try and keep all the other figures basically in line with where they came in uh, this past winter when they finally approved the FY21 budget. As I also mentioned, as we think that we're gonna to start to get some very preliminary figures from the governor, uh, the, the school figure is still an unknown. Our hope is that they would continue to at least level fund it, but we still wanna be conservative on our projections here. The figures typically based on enrollment, we're not sure how, how broad the snapshot is the state's gonna start looking at. Um, for communities on their enrollment figures, where many communities, not just Wilmington, have seen a decrease in, in their students enrolled, um, largely in part because of, of COVID working from or uh, online learning and those who can get enrolled into uh, private schools that do offer in-person learning. So that's a challenge, not unique to Wilmington, but that's a challenge we're trying to figure out how to best handle it. And then lastly on this page too, down below, you're gonna see an item of offset receipts for public libraries. Uh, this is gonna come up again on the statutory charges a little bit later. And what this is, is as a line item in the cherry sheet where they list revenues for the public libraries and they're gonna take them away later on, on our expenses. So it's essentially, it's, it's money that is allocated that just doesn't even touch our touch our bank account, but it, do, it does flow through on our budget sheet that you'll see. And that number is gonna go in on the revenue side and come right back out on the expense side. And then moving on to page 10, this is a little bit of detail on the indirect charges. This again is, the majority of it still stems from the water department um, and shared costs between DPW, uh, town hall, as well as a lot of insurance benefits and those type of costs that are borne through the general fund that we get paid back on by the, the water. And now moving forward from the sewer, uh, this also includes debt service from the sewer. That's the biggest component of their indirect charges is that the, the town's required to pay the debt service out of the general fund. And then the enterprise fund is gonna have to pay the general fund back for those since they are essentially owed by the, the sewer fund. And that's gonna do it for the revenue piece of this. Uh, moving on to page 11, this is just a very high level summary where Jeff did touch upon a lot of the key drivers of what we had to factor for crafting the budget here. We wanna present a balanced budget and we had, we had some challenges in trying to project where we can where we can draw the line and what, what we need to include here. Um, the general government line is relatively flat compared to the prior year. Public safety does have the, a pretty sizable bump of nearly 8%. And a lot of that is gonna be driven that we'll talk about as we get on to the, the public safety meeting, what challenges we've seen from over time um, and other COVID related issues. Public works is down in, in part from the, the trash agreement and the assumption that um, the vote of paying off the trash barrels is gonna result in obviously a, a decrease in their operating budget as well. We're not paying the extra 45,000 a year on just paying off that loan over the next few years. Public buildings, their decrease as Jeff had mentioned is related to largely from uh, their decrease in heating costs. 
human services is related to in part from veteran services, as well as some savings we've had on, or some reductions in cost on library. I believe Jeff had also touched on um, the school piece. I know we also mentioned it in pretty good detail last night, both on uh, the Wilmington Public Schools end of it, increasing two and a half percent, as well as the noticeable spike on the tech assessment. That's still a very preliminary number. We do know that enrollment wise, the, it, it's gone up. So we have to assume that our share is going to increase and we're trying to project as best we can. Um, <clears throat> and as Jeff had mentioned that they're working on trying to trying to hone in on their true figures as well. And we should know more in the next couple of weeks. When you start looking at combined cost under maturing debt and interest, um, we actually realize savings there and that's not all too common. Um, we have not taken on any additional new debt in the past couple of years, so it has dropped off a little bit. But the noticeable jump is from the refinancing um, of the school debt. Over 16 years, uh, we stand to realize pretty significant gains. I believe it's going to be well over $3 million, all told, is what we would save on the bottom line from the school end of it on the debt from the high school project. And that alone is a decrease of about 229,000 um, basically each year for the next 16 years on that item. For unclassifieds, uh, Kerry will talk about insurance in a, little, in a little bit. The other line below that, the unclassified miscellaneous, that's really driven from our Medicare contribution. That's the 1.45% really on the salary end. And that has to basically keep pace with any salary cost borne by the town. Statutory charges, the increase there is driven by our retirement assessment, which was not as significant as we had, had planned on. So we have seen a little bit of savings on our, our contribution to Middlesex. We can talk about that in a little bit. And then the Warren article, that's up $50,000. That's gonna be tied to the 4th of July, um, which we had not been able to include in last year's budget, but we're planning to include for now at least I'm operating under the assumption that we are. Jeff, I think we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. We're, we're, gonna, be optimists. Line, we're gonna be optimists that uh, come July 4th, at least there'll be some semblance of uh, normalcy. <laughs> exactly. And then the last line there, as Jeff noted, is the decrease in capital. The number from the prior year from 21 or our current year of over 5 million was a pretty significant jump we had seen over past years. In capital this year, the number is a little bit over 3 million with the majority of that um, being offset by free cash to help supplement it. And then page 12, it's just a similar pie chart as opposed to the one for the revenues. This is just showing us a high level category as to where the charge is, where the money's going out by grouping here. And then what I'm gonna do now is I'm actually just gonna skip ahead a little bit through the budget book if we want to just continue on talking about um, our debt and interest, we can skip ahead to page 59. And as I'd indicated before, we're, we're looking at some pretty significant uh, reduction of costs there. One of the things we've kept consistent is basically the fees that we have. It's $175,000. We spent so far in FY21, we've spent about $120,000 there. That's been an item that has been underspent in the past couple of years. The spending there was related to our high school refunding um, process. Uh, that's between bond council for um, the closing of it, for getting the rating from Standard & Poor. There's a lot of costs that tie into that, uh, but at the bottom, at the end of the day, the bottom line of saving um, just this year alone, over 200,000 for spending that 120 is well worth it when you realize those savings are gonna be there year over year for the next 16 years. As you move through the, the pages after the high level summary of the interest in debt, you're gonna start seeing just a breakdown of the debt. This is the same layout it's been historically. <clears throat> for us, we're just gonna show the combined outstanding debt <clears throat> excuse me, that the town has. And as you'll see on the right-hand side under the total, it does continue to decrease as the way the debt's been structured. This debt will continue to fall off the book. We don't have any escalating debt. It, it all dwindles down as you get closer to paying off uh, those borrowings, but we do anticipate in the future to potentially explore 
um, whether it's whether it makes sense to to start adding on in some way, shape, or form. Jeff mentioned last night that our debt service, as part of our operating budget, is about three percent or so, a little less. That's that's on the low end um, of comparable comparable towns in in the area in Massachusetts. So there is some capacity there that we continue to work on on clearing out. Uh, page 61 of the school debt. This is now strictly just the high school. We had a project with the, the Shawshank school that has been finally paid off. The debt here presented is strictly the high school project. And if you looked at this page last year for FY22, we would have been looking at about 2.8 million um, in charges in, in debt service. That's now 2.6 million. It's a savings of about 229,000 over the year. And over the grand scheme of things through FY 2037, we'll actually save $3.9 million from the refunding of the high school debt. So that's pretty significant. Otherwise, as you look through it, that's gonna just show the debt that we have for, um, for a fire pumper. Um, our listing of our sewer debt, 64 and 65 are just strictly the debt we have from water projects. And then we have the debt service on the recreation piece of Gentile Farm. Moving on to page 67, just gonna be a look at some of those shared costs again. This is just the first part of our unclassified expenses. The first piece here is funding for when we have employees retire, paying off their, excuse me, basically their buyback on unused sick time we still have to reasonably budget this where it's at. It's been level funded to 220. And there's just the potential given the age of our employee demographic that we do have potential obligations that could be pretty sizable. If, if certain people or a, a vast number of people who could potentially retire, do retire and have obligations that would render the payout here. So we do need to keep this the same in my opinion. Uh, we had talked about this uh, myself, Jeff, Kerry, and a handful of meetings with talked to department heads and just trying to gauge uh, the demographics of our employees. And there is, uh, there is some potential here. I, I don't, we don't know. It's still very early to know people's plans going, you know, 12 months, 18 hours, what the future holds. So we, we, we don't know and we have to keep this conservative. The next line is, as I noted earlier, the Medicare employer share, the 1.45 on the salary end. And we try to keep this in pace with the increases we have on the salary side. So that's, that, that's an increase that um, we've seen over the past few years and we're gonna continue to see. Uh, the salary adjustments, uh, we did increase that to 900,000 this year in our budget. And, and what you'll see as we start, as you guys start having various department heads in, is you'll notice the salary lines in some cases actually decrease where they've had some retirements and they're filling those positions uh, with, with newer employees on lower steps. Or you'll see other departments where their budget comes in nearly identical to the way it was the year before. Uh, that's a factor of a couple things. One is everyone working uh, together to try and hold the line on the expense piece of it. Uh, the other piece is on the salary end where there hasn't been any it's been level funded on the salary end with the assumption that if we have any collectively bargained increases or when those come into play is that they're gonna get covered through the salary adjustment line. Uh, a lot of times the funding or the payouts of this don't come under the salary adjustment line because those have to get transferred out to each individual salary line to help balance their budget in cases where we have Retirements, we have to pay for longevity. We have to pay for um, cost of living increases or newly agreed upon uh, union agreements. So there is um, the need for this to help defray those costs. And that, that's how the, the budget is, is tied out to this. This line also does cover some other costs that uh, HR has to bear as far as unemployment costs go, employee screening costs, uh, there's a couple other costs in here too that is miscellaneous costs that have that have to be covered. So when you look at the last couple of years, it, it, the payments under here do fluctuate, but the vast majority of this is tied to internal transfers to balance the budget. 
The next couple items are local, tran um, local transportation for training conferences, out-of-state travel. We've kept that flat um, everywhere in FY20, lots of communities, not just Wilmington, had projected costs for conferences, for travel, for training. And obviously a lot of those fell flat because conferences couldn't happen or conferences have been held virtually at a, at a much cheaper rate, if not uh, for gratis. But we do anticipate at some point the need of some degree of local training. We kept those at the same level. Uh, the annual audit was also level funded. We're approaching our last year of our current agreement with our audit firm. That's gonna go through the audit of the FY21 financials, which will be in the FY22 budget. Uh, we have that level funded. There could be some additional costs based on the degree of, I guess the degree of difficulty or the, the more work that will be involved in the accounting end on the back end of the, the refunding, but that again is still well worth it. Otherwise that's still under the, uh, the same figure as outlined in the contract. And then we will, um, have to work in the future for trying to figure out how we're going to cover, or how we're going to come to an agreement, but we are still covered through the FY22 budget under our current agreement. Our agreement on the ambulance billing is, um, we typically vote to increase that or budget that as a 2.5% increase. Uh, the other lines have all been level funded. Um, the town report, the calendar uh, done by the manager's office, the professional and technical services line, as well as the reserve fund for the finance committee, that's also at 1.2 million as it has been. The next page here actually speaks to the insurance costs the town will, um, will bear. And I'll actually turn this over to Carrie, if she doesn't mind speaking to, to our insurance costs as well actually, as- uh, Actually, before you do, Brian, does anyone yeah, have any ahead. questions? Does anyone have Sorry. any questions for Brian? No? John, is there anyone on the line that wants to ask a question or? There currently is not. Great, thank you. Okay, then Carrie. Carrie. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, if you'd like to turn to page 68, I'd like to go over the insurance budget with you. And there are three major categories to the insurance budget. The first are uh, insurances that we procure from Maya, and that's Massachusetts Interlocal Insurance Association. Uh, Maya provides insurance to municipalities in the state of Massachusetts and also to nonprofits in the state of Massachusetts. Um, the major types of insurance that the town obtains from Maya is the public liability officials um, insurance, workers' compensation for regular workers, and this is not including police and fire, um, automobile property and general liability insurances. In November, the town received notification from Maya that we should plan on an increase of 10 to 15% for our insurance costs uh, for fiscal 22. And knowing that, and also knowing that we have some other drivers that are bound to increase our insurance, such as our, um, our actual claims that we've had in areas like workers' comp, and we've had some public official claims that we have paid out. When we look at the experience ratios, I'm expecting an increase, and I think 15% is probably where we'll come in. Um, I was not able to obtain a, a number from Maya, but I think 15% is a fair number to be used. And there's a couple of other reasons, um, I think, that are driving the cost increases at Maya. In the past, they had a uh, program called Maya Rewards, and that program has been diminishing in the most recent years. Um, the rewards program is provided, um, provides points to municipalities for doing certain things, such as roof inspections or um, police having um, participation in certain types of um, uh, demonstrations of public safety. And they would bring a, a unit to the uh, public safety building. It's almost like a video game, a simulation. And uh, another example of uh, something that you would get rewards credits for would be uh, attending a conference or um, 
a webinar or having trainings within the town. And what we're finding is all of our insurance providers are working from home. Um, so they're not running the trainings. And if they do run trainings, it's just minimal and they're online and many of which we don't get rewards points for anymore. So we're seeing a decrease in these rewards points, which are turned into dollars at the end of the fiscal year. And you can use the points as credits towards your bill. Um, so I think that's gonna be one of the drivers to also impact the town that we won't have as much to offset because we, we aren't able to obtain the points like we used to. We do take advantage of the 3% pre prepayment um, discount each year. So we pay our invoice as soon as we get it and that provides a 3% um, discount off the bill. So <clears throat> I have included, as you can see, the 15% increase in all of the Meyer insurances. The second category of insurance that the town procures is the 111F insurance from uh, Gallery Insurance. And we are seeing increases in 111F police and fire injured on duty claims. Um, and that line item is proposed to increase from 130,000 to 150,000 next year. Our current um, year to date spend in that line item is already 67% as of the end of December. And finally, the third um, the component of the insurance budget is the employee health insurance and employees and retirees also are able to have a $5,000 life insurance policy and they pay 25% of that policy and the town pays 75%. Um, we're projecting a 1% increase in health insurance for next year. Our um, third party administrator had recommended 2% increase, but our trend right now is looking very good. We have zero high cost claims for this um, year so far. So we know that there is a lot of pent up demand because people aren't going to um, see a healthcare provider to have any kind of mandatory, um, well, they're only having the mandatory procedures and not having any elective procedures. So we're seeing a delay in, um, claims, zero high cl cost claims, and that means anything over 175,000. We've had none for this plan year, which began June 1st. And um, we're also seeing that our experience for regular claims in general is running in a positive trend. And we have right now uh, 1.2 million in the positive for the plan year because we make a, a level funded payment each month to Blue Cross. And then what happens is we offset it by the actual claims that come in. So our trend right now is in the positive of 1.2 million, but we don't know when people will start seeking treatments that they've been putting off and how much those procedures will cost. So I think the 1% is just to show we definitely have pent up demand. We just don't know when and how we'll see the impact of it. And I'm glad to answer any questions. Anybody have any questions for Carrie? Yeah, I do. How many um, employees do we have out on uh, disability uh, workman's comp? On workman's comp, I didn't look at that number today. I can give that to you on Thursday. Okay. I do have a new report. Marianne, and I'll check that out and give you a number. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Anything else? Anything else for Kerry? Seeing none. Oh. Jeff? Okay, uh, so uh, the next um, uh, page is uh, page 69, uh, which uh, reflects the sta uh, statutory charges um, just going down the list here. Uh, I can, Brian, I can did you talk to these, yeah. No, I don't, I don't mind talking to these. No, the first item, as, as Jeff mentioned on the statutory charges page here is uh, the figure for the overlay that we need to set every year for abatements. 
Uh, we've consistently set that at 900,000 a year. Uh, this does not have, the, the, the way the allowance for abatements works here is that we don't actually pay the money directly out of an expense. It reduces our revenues on the real estate, the personal property tax end of it coming in. So, so we need to set this here and it's gonna get offset basically with our projected revenue with any figure that's abated, but we do need to, to reasonably set a, a figure that we are gonna use for, for the upcoming year. The next line is the retirement contributions. This is for our um, Middlesex County retirement system. We have been projecting typically about a six and a half percent increase yearly um, as recommended by the Collins Center uh, for this. We got a new valuation probably late summer, uh, probably, probably mid fall or so, um, which the actuary for the retirement system will present us with basically our uh, obligations, our liabilities for the next two fiscal years. Um, we have been prepaying to some degree, um, advancing additional funds for our retirement obligation to try and realize some savings and help pay it down. This is one of the items that we, we get dinged on every time we go to Standard & Poor uh, to get a bond rating is that one of their, their credit weaknesses that they have is the, the, the standing of the retirement system and the liabilities that it has and how it gets apportioned out and how it, how it impacts our obligations. So we, uh, again, we plan typically for about a six and a half percent increase. We've realized a, a, a decent savings with the fact that we have been prepaying and realized some reduction in our liability. So for FY22, our contribution would actually be about $7.9 million if we paid in installments. What we do is we pay it in a lump sum on July 1 at the start of the fiscal year. So we do have a discount there. And so what that figure is that we would owe is $7,801,298. Um, so we have that in the line item for this year. That's about a 2.7% increase. Our figure for FY23 um, with the one-time July 1 payment um, with the discount that you get by that is about 8.3 million. And that's about a 6.7% increase. Percent increase. So, so the increases are still there. Our, Hope in the meantime is that the prepayments continue to work because we would have another two fiscal years potentially um, for a total of about 300, uh, excuse me, 3 million um, in additional prepayments. According to Middlesex County's actuary, um, the first wave of our prepayments that we've done, um, the total 3 million, had realized about 6.7 million in savings or decrease to our liability obligation. So we're hoping that this continues to work. And in the big picture, we hope that we realize some notable savings and we hope that it's something that kind of can get the attention of S&P next time we have to go to, um, to a bond rating as well as just a practical matter of its help, helping to drive down our costs for the next 15 years while we continue to um, have a pretty significant cost for retirement. After that is the, the figure for the offset items. That's the, the item we had on the state aid piece, the 34,466. This is the money that the state will put into our budget as uh, the revenue side and they're gonna take it away um, when they're paying us the state aid. So we have to offset and account for this as well. Uh, this goes towards um, public libraries. Uh, but it's direct expenditure by the state, but we do need to account for it. it. It shows up on the revenue, comes right out on the expense. And then after this, we're gonna start looking at a lot of the other um, state assessments that we have. The recommendations again from the Collins Center are to continue to plan on a two and a half percent increase on these. A few of these items are pretty much dead on year over year um, for the town at two and a half percent. Moving forward on these, we're looking at the MBTA assessments, the biggest of our assessments here that we have from, uh, from the state. We were projecting that at 548,000. Last year's budget was 546, so it actually came in about 535,000 for FY21 um, about a month ago. Uh, the charges for the next few of them for, for MAP, uh, MAPSI, um, 
we have that projected at 13.1. That's an increase over the 12.8 that we had seen for the actual where we were about 12.9 in our budget. The RMV non-renewal surcharge is how in our collections end it does tie into uh, to the RMVA for RMV for anything that's outstanding um, on, on renewal. So we do need to do this. This does realize some savings on the collection end for us as well beyond the fact that it is a statutory state assessment we do need to pay. Um, the Metro air pollution is another one, two and a half percent increase projected there. Uh, from our actual, that would bring us to about 8.8, um, 8,875. Uh, the mosquito control project, same thing, two and a half percent increase to bring us to about 70,800. The MWRA sewer assessment, that is our assessment for sewers, obviously. That is something that we stripped out of the operating budget as the sewer um, enterprise had uh, become a thing in FY21. So those um, charges are now paid through the user fees collected on the sewer end in the enterprise fund. School choice and charter schools and special ed, the next three are ones that are to some degree bottle. Uh, it's hard to really gauge how the future is gonna look on those. Um, so we still have to basically look to what we have currently and how we can hopefully manage the churn here. I talked to um, the school's assistant superintendent for administration and finance previously on this, just to kind of outline what we have for students that are currently enrolled in charter schools, the same go, um, the same for school choice as far as sending goes. I don't believe that Wilmington's truly a part of the school choice where students opt in and out, but there is some degree of ability for students to opt out with having students from other districts opt into Wilmington. You're frozen. Uh... <clears throat> John, is, is that on his end? Yeah, there's nothing I can do about that. Okay. Uh, so uh, we'll take a, a time out. Uh, so I, I guess just picking up the uh, from there, and when, certainly when Brian jumps back on, we can go from there. But um, uh, as he mentioned, he talked to Paul Ruggiero about these to try to get some indication as to the numbers. This is always a, a challenging one because um, the, the numbers do uh, move around a bit. Um, is there any questions on this page? I'll just go to the next page, uh, the warrant uh, articles. You may have, anybody have any questions for, for Jeff? Um, yeah, I just, I guess I'll ask Paul, but I'd like to get a idea where, why we're jumping so much on special ed from eight to 22,000. Okay, well, like we can uh, try to get some further information on that. All right, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know where I was when I dropped out. Um, I think you were uh, about to, not sure. <laughs> you were talking about uh, special, uh, the, the three accounts there and then you kind of went into okay. freeze mode. Okay, yeah, no, I wasn't sure what, um, where you guys lost me. Um, as far as school choice, charter school, special education, um, I had talked to the assistant superintendent over at schools too, just to get a handle on our numbers for students we have enrolled there um, and trying to just reasonably assume that we can continue with the two and a half percent increases uh, that we have been. There is some degree of volatility there that we don't see in some of the other lines. We're trying to be as reasonable as we can on the projections for those three. And then Ryan, the um, Marianne did ask about the, uh, the special ed number where it's going from the uh, 8474 uh, up to 22,272. Um, did, did we get particular information from Paul indicating a, a jump in student enrollment there? Or 
the, stu a student. Uh, the, the actual for 21, when it came out, it was last year, the figures we had through the committees was about 8,000. And then when it was finalized by, by this year, it had jumped up to the 21,000. Okay. So, so the actual for 21 was 21,729. So we're kind of using that as a better base, baseline for 22. Okay. Thank you. And then for the North Shore Tech, we had got, I got a list from um, basically a roster of the students from Wilmington that are enrolled there. It had jumped up in the fall, um, an additional freshman that we had before. So we had an extra student there. And then it's just trying to basically manage the churn of kids who graduate as, and balance it out with the new kids who come in. We don't honestly have a way of knowing. Knowing that now, I'm sure they don't even know that at this point. So we're, we're trying our best to manage and project some sort of growth there. And, and just do what we can to try and project a fair figure for those. Anybody have any questions for Brian on this page? No? All right, moving on to page 70 for the warrant articles. This is pretty similar to how we had it for FY21. The one exception, as I mentioned earlier, is we do at least want to build the budget moving forward with the funding for the 4th of July. Um, otherwise, everything here is consistent with how it was for FY21. We'll have the funding in place for Memorial and Veterans Day. We have the 1500 in place for the Veterans Quarters. We have a million dollars going to the OPEV Trust Fund. We have $1 million going to the Capital Stabilization. And then we have 1.5 million solely dedicated for the prepayment of the retirement. In the past, we've kind of split it between funding some of the prepayment and then funding some towards the trust that we have or the stabilization for retirement. And we've, we've seen a bigger bang for our buck on the prepayment end, so we're gonna to continue uh, to do that in the, in the, in the near future. Okay. Any questions for Brian on, on this page? Seeing none? The next few pages here are strictly just a little bit more detail um, on the capital improvement projects here for the articles. Um, Jeff had already gone through on a high level um, some of the big ticket ones here. And I know that as the departments have their individual appointments, they'll start to explain a lot of their capital projects as well. So I just kind of skipped through uh, 71, 72 and 73 for now. And then the next pages after that um, are gonna be for the water department. Um, they'll be able to talk a little bit more in depth. That's really just informational as they're not part of the operating budget. And then the sewer fund is its own enterprise. They'll also speak to it when DPW is here. Um, their budget page is a little different. We'll, we'll talk more, but they just need to be able to show um, a balanced budget in that their own revenue from user charges is offset with their costs on operating and as well as the, the capital charges and the, the debt and any indirect charges that they have that they pay to the general fund. Page 77 is our annual page dedicated to the public rank. Um, we put this in, we have not had any expenditures paid out since there was a vote in, I believe it was FY17, um, when the town had been contemplating on purchasing the arena in town. Um, from what I understand, there was a pretty narrow specific language that if the town was able to do that, there was a appropriation made. And then if the town had been able to secure it, that they would also um, set up an enterprise fund for the, um, under the recreation for the public rank where the expenses would be offset um, by user charges. We include this still, um, we taught, we, we just know either way, whether we include it or not, there's gonna be questions if people ask why it's in there. And if we don't include it, people are gonna ask why it's not in there. Uh, but this is essentially a placeholder in the event that the town is able to somehow secure um, the premises under the vote from FY17 um, to simply authorize uh, the execution of the enterprise account. I'm not sure if there's anything more to it than that, Jeff, if you wanna to speak to it or um, no, just to uh, refresh everybody's memory, you'll, you'll recall that we had a special town meeting uh, to authorize, uh, to raise an appropriate or borrow 2.25 million 
uh, for the first uh, purchase of the Restucia rink, which at the time we thought we had an opportunity to do, uh, ultimately didn't come to pass. Uh, so that authorization still remains in effect. Um, of course, at this point, um, it doesn't appear to be any ability to purchase the rink or certainly purchase the rink uh, for that amount of money. So as part of that special town meeting, uh, there were actions taken to establish, as, as Brian noted, this uh, enterprise fund that would have allowed, as in many cases, when municipalities own rinks, uh, they set up these enterprise funds so that the uh, cost for the ice time, and in some cases, the concessions uh, go back into this enterprise account, and then they pay for the salaries and maintenance and so on associated with the rink. So um, it, 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 exactly as Brian noted, it's a placeholder uh, back when uh, Mike Morris and I, and I think Kendra Amaral at the time, uh, were working on uh, putting a budget together. These were the numbers that we came up with uh, as to the cost of uh, potentially operating a rink. Uh, and those numbers have just remained fixed for that period of time. So um, it's really no harm, no foul, other than the fact that it does, I think, confuse people because there's a question as to why we're uh, continuing to carry it. Um, you know, at some point in time, I guess uh, there'll probably have to be a decision as to whether to um, remove this from the budget and, and as a practical matter on the appropriation side, um, uh, there'll have to be a decision perhaps uh, at some point in the next few years whether to um, go to town meeting and seek to revoke that authorization. If in fact there's, unless there's a clear uh, ability to acquire the rink, but that's certainly a decision or a discussion for another day. Jeff, the uh, money that was appropriated though, that would be probably on the lower end of what it would go for now. That's right. Yeah, I, I seem to recall, uh, in, in the number escapes me, but when um, the current outfit uh, purchased the rink, it was, it was well above that number. So yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, to the extent it became available going forward, or even if there was uh, an attempt to pursue it via eminent domain, I suspect the, the value of that rink would be higher than, higher. yeah. yeah. Any questions for Brian on this last page? Seeing none. Next. Right, I, so I uh, think, yeah, yeah, I think we're gonna start to, um, to skip around a little bit and go back to okay. the beginning of the budget book on page 13 and 14. And I think Jeff will give us a quick high level on the staffing of town operations. Right, so uh, just going back to page 13, um, you'll see that um, uh, actually um, the, the only change on the first page here uh, is in the um, town manager's office. And you'll see that the number goes from seven to six uh, only because the uh, payroll uh, and benefits coordinator uh, position who has been in our office for the last couple of years uh, we're transitioning that into the finance uh, under uh, uh, Brian's uh, bailiwick. So uh, you'll see on the uh, finance and accounting side that his number goes up. So uh, that that um, last year, you'll recall, or this current year, we went from six to seven because we added the HR generalist uh, position. In fact, the person who is currently or had been the um, uh, payroll and benefits coordinator uh, is now going is now the new uh, HR generalist. Uh, so we're going to be looking for a, a payroll uh, benefits person here. Uh, so just below that, you'll see uh, the accounting number goes from three to four. Uh, when you go down the line uh, for the rest of the departments, uh, everything remains uh, true, except when you get to uh, police, you see it goes from uh, the current number of 54 up to 55, which as I indicated earlier is uh, due to the recommended uh, addition of a sergeant. Uh, and then on the next page, uh, 14, uh, everything uh, remains consistent there, except in public buildings, you'll see the number goes from 47 to 48 uh, to reflect a proposed uh, relief custodian 
uh, and bottom line, uh, you'll see the total number of uh, employees uh, full and part-time goes from 310 to 312. Uh, so unless there's any questions, I'll just move on to uh, the Selectman's uh, general government budget. Uh, so in this uh, category, you see the uh, cost for the recording secretary, that's Beverly Dalton, who covers the uh, Selectman's minutes uh, then we have um, a miscellaneous uh, contractual services that remains the same uh, as it was uh, the previous year, um, or uh, that remains the same as it is this year. You'll see that the spike in fiscal 20 uh, was associated, uh, I believe, in part with the, um, the expenses associated with having the town meeting um, uh, at the ball field there. We, we incurred some costs associated with uh, renting the tent and so on, but otherwise um, the number is back to the uh, 6,500, which includes um, uh, potentially going forward um, any uh, participation that the selectmen may have in with the Mass Municipal Association attending sessions there, um, any parking, uh, any travel related expenses if they go into Boston. Again, we're hoping that at some point in time we'll be back to a more normal mode of operation here. Uh, printing and binding, uh, this is for town topics. As you know, that goes out quarterly uh, and the, the cost is uh, $33.50. Uh, and then the $1,200 uh, is associated with uh, the legal notices that go out in the event we have uh, uh, street acceptance uh, requirements uh, per the uh, warrant if someone's looking to get a street accepted and it goes on the warrant, there's legal notices associated with that. Also, there's a legal notice uh, that gets uh, posted in advance of Karen Rashis' uh, tax classification hearing, uh, and then any other legal notices that may come up, whether it's a, uh, a license of some sort that comes before the board. Um, so that really uh, pretty much covers the uh, Board of Selectmen's um, budget. Uh, the next category uh, on page 16 will skip until um, you're meeting with the town clerk because that deals with the elections. Uh, and then we'll go to the uh, finance committee budget. Uh, we have uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, first line item there is, um, is the cost for uh, the recording secretary here, Christine, uh, covering your meetings. Uh, the biggest uh, chunk of your budget is associated with the printing associated with the uh, finance committee uh, report that uh, will go out at the conclusion of your meetings and is sent to residents uh, in uh, preparation for annual town meeting. Uh, the other uh, expenses are quite modest, the dues from uh, the Mass Finance Committee Association of $300. Uh, $200 for a training and uh, conference, and then a modest $25 for office supplies. Uh, fortunately, Christine brings her own pens. Uh, next is um, IT, and we'll cover that uh, when the IT budget comes up a little bit later in the month. And now we're back to Brian on the finance uh, town accountant. That would be page 23. I think we skipped the town manager's budget. Town manager. We did. Oh, we won. Uh, I'll yes, take that. that. <laughs> just by design. Okay. Uh, so just on this one, uh, obviously in terms of salaries, uh, uh, my salary at the top there, uh, and then uh, the remaining individuals in the office. Uh, so my salary is at the 164089. Um, uh, the next uh, category is for the remaining five people in the office, which would be uh, Beverly Dalton, uh, uh, Christine uh, Caggiano, Wendy Martinello, uh, Carrie, and, uh, and Kathy Godfrey. Um, as I mentioned, uh, one of those positions is moving to the accountant's position, uh, accountant's uh, department, uh, which is the payroll uh, benefits uh, coordinator and we're uh, picking up the HR generalist, which as I noted, uh, 
Kathy Godfrey uh, recently uh, assumed. Uh, then we have um, under contractual services, uh, postage and printing 58,000, uh, it remains as it is this year. This is, uh, covers all the postage uh, that goes out, uh, whether it's postage for tax bills or uh, there's a lot of mailings still that uh, uh, go out, uh, legal notices, uh, Federal Express, um, it also covers uh, letterhead, uh, binding of selectmen's minutes, uh, uh, all of those things get grouped under uh, excise tax bills. Um, all of those things get grouped under that category for the 58,000. Uh, the next category, uh, miscellaneous contractual, uh, is 6,000 and this covers uh, the various memberships that we have to the Mass Municipal Association uh, we're members or I'm, uh, have memberships to the Mass Municipal Managers Association, the International City Managers Association. Uh, those are all uh, paid for uh, out of that category. And then we have uh, $6,000 uh, for uh, training and conference um, would pay for um, the, any conferences, of course, there hasn't been any of late, but again, uh, if we get on to a more normal circumstance that there may be um, managers meetings or um, the Mass Municipal Association uh, annual conference this year, they did it, uh, of course, uh, virtually, uh, but that would be covered under that category and that remains uh, as it is in the current fiscal year. And then finally, uh, the last category comes under uh, materials and supplies, uh, which again is remains the same uh, at 8,700. <clears throat> Any questions for Jeff on the town manager budget? Uh, so the then uh, next it'd be, um, would be back to Brian on page 23. Thank you, yes, for the, the budget for the accountant's office. Um, as Jeff mentioned, we actually picked up a new FTE that will show the increase on the, the salary side for this office. Um, starting off on the top as a uh, salary for my position, the finance director. And then we have for other full-time now, we have the assistant finance director position, the accounting assistant, and now we have added um, the position that we're looking to fill for. Oh, he's frozen again. Yeah, <laughs> frozen in time. Hmm. Um, I'm so, okay, I thought you lost me in us. It's simply the- You're Muted, Brian. Oh. All right. Is this any better? Yes. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I'll try and get through this a little quicker. The increase on the salaries is just from the, the FTE edition that nets out from Jeff's office. On the contractual services, our miscellaneous contractual is for our association dues that's paid every year. That's about $340 of it. The other is for every other year we have to pay for the OPEB study. Uh, for the actuarial service for the town. That's a $10,000 line item in there that's in there every other year. And then we also added $1,000 for the check folding machine service agreement for um, taking on the, the payroll and benefits position. So we'll, we'll, we'll house that and we'll work on the service agreement there. Um, otherwise, the line item for training and conference remains the same for all the association trainings, uh, meetings and seminars. And then our office supplies remains constant at a thousand. A lot of that goes uh, towards to some degree publishing the books, printing, um, and just various office supplies needed through um, to facilitate the daily operations of the accounting office. Do you have any questions for Brian? Seeing the next. All right, the next one is page 24, and this is the treasurer collector. And uh, Pam, are you 
Yeah, I'm still here. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, salary is the first uh, line item is my annual salary. Um, other uh, five full-time employees, one uh, which is paid from the water department, uh, you know, contractual salary increases there. Um, and then my budget doesn't really change a lot. So miscellaneous contractual consists of printing, stuffing, and mailing bills, a service of motor vehicle warrants, um, archive storage for payroll records, lockbox fees. So this is the fees that uh, when you mail in your tax payment in the envelope provided, um, the bank processes all these payments. And of course, there's fees associated with that. So I budget for that annually. Um, and then miscellaneous um, fees with uh, invoice cloud or online service. So, you know, if somebody is online making a payment and they put in a wrong bank account number and it kicks back, they charge us $5. I do not pass that along to the resident. Um, I budget for, for it. Um, the other costs are for printing, advertising, and binding. So this covers envelopes, bill forms, um, W-2s, 1099s and advertising costs for tax titles and tailings. Um, the other fees, um, training and conference, of course, as Jeff and others had mentioned, we didn't have those this past year. I'm hopeful that we do have them this year. This is a uh, annual mass collector treasurer's uh, conference out at UMass Amherst. Um, so I you know, wanna keep that in the budget and hopefully uh, they will have that this year. It's a great venue. Um, and last is office supplies. Oh, I'm okay. sorry. One last item is tax titles. Um, I pretty much, uh, you know, request the same amount every year, $27,000. This covers all the legal costs involved in the annual tax titles and um, also going through any foreclosures. So... Anybody have any questions for Pam? Seeing none, next. So next we're going to page uh, 20, uh, actually page 30, and this would be uh, Board of Assessors. So uh, Karen, I think she's uh, ready to take this one. You're muted, Karen. Yep. I'm muting. Sorry, I was a little preoccupied watching the uh, plow plow me in outside the town hall window. <laughs> but that's that's all right. Um, so my uh, first line item is obviously my salary, and I have a staff of two. And um, one of the staff members, our assistant assessor, he's uh, actually both are relatively new. One's been here for a year, and one's been here for two years. So when I get to the uh, training part of our um, budget, uh, even though um, we had COVID, the International Assessors Association, as well as the Mass Assessors Association, still held um, several meetings and workshops and seminars. And um, Tristan was able to take a couple of um, online classes. Um, I was able to attend the International Assessors Association meeting, which is usually in another state, so I often don't go because of travel related expenses. Um, but this year it was fun to be able to uh, attend that. They did a really good job being all remote. Um, so we kept that line item the same in anticipation of still being able to um, continue our education with that. But uh, to back up to the miscellaneous contractual services, that line's a little bit different for me. Um, that covers our um, building permit inspections, it covers our uh, inspections from our vendor for RRC who does personal property inspections and a cyclical inspection. So you see there's a substantial um, decrease in that line item and that's because last year we had, um, it was fiscal year 21 was our revaluation year. However, um, we also had included 2,500 parcels for our cyclical inspection that we needed to get done. However, with COVID um, getting into people's homes has been <clears throat> excuse me, unrealistic. Um, we're not going into people's homes. So to pay for a vendor to just do an exterior um, measurements, really not uh, accomplishing what the task is to make sure our data is correct on the entire process. So we have not gone out to bid um, to get that done. So that money 
um, is still there for this year. And next year, we are uh, the amount of parcels we are going to, um, we budgeted to get done is half of that, it's closer to 1200 because we can spread it out over a little bit longer period of time. The um, appraisals and inventories line item also decreased because that was uh, largely made up of our um, costs for the vision technologies to do the revaluation in RRC to do the personal property valuation for the fiscal year 21 um, recertification process. The $13,000 that remains in there, um, just uh, to share with you, um, that that is made up of our um, ability to do audits on personal property and to pay for um, the Department of Revenue changed the methodology for valuing utility companies. So Boston Gas, New England Power, Mass Electric, Columbia Gas, all of those, we had to have um, professional appraisals done. And that's an, this looks like it's gonna be an annual um, event, but it's a, a new methodology. So the, in the past, um, these companies have always just reported their um, net book value. And now there's a, what's called a 50-50 method. So what that meant for us this year is thank you. You gave us the uh, funds to um, hire the professionals to do these full-blown appraisals, but on Boston Gas alone, the value, our opinion of value versus their opinion with the new methodology was $9.4 million higher. Um, and that translated into $295,000 in, um, in tax from them for doing that. Uh, new England Power was another 435,000. So we build out over $10 million in um, new personal property value on the utility companies, which translated into over $300,000 in tax. So. Um, our, our ten thousand dollar investment, you know, found us three hundred nine thousand um, dollars in return. So we do have that same monies budgeted this year because uh, the values change annually. That's um, our appellate tax board cases. Twenty thousand dollars has remained the same. We have not had too many big cases that have been called up lately. We have been able to uh, settle most of them. Um, however. If their utility companies have filed. Obviously, they don't like the new methodology, um, the 50-50 method. Um, what I will say, though, is I have had conversations with the attorney that represents the utility companies, and um, he knows who we hired and the methodology. Uh, our Boston gas line is relatively new in Wilmington, so they've replaced a lot of those parts as reflected in the new growth that they've been reporting over the past few years. And um, knowing who we hired in the work that they do, he said um, the, in the situation about the depreciation because uh, that's one of their issues that he'd be filing the withdrawals on the fiscal year 19 and 20 um, cases if the values that we discussed for 21 stayed the same. Um, which they did. I had no reason to, to change those. We went with the appraisal. So that was really, I think, a testament to if you do quality work, um, that it also helps out at the appeals level as well. Um, so the, the $20,000, I would also just say, you know, Jeff had one time and said, geez, you haven't had any cases. Can we reduce that? But what I will say to you, it's almost like um, a little insurance policy. So when I have a large tax case coming up, and I'm negotiating with someone, uh, they're like, the town of Wilmington's not gonna try this because you don't have the money to pay for the appraisals and the court time and whatever. But I'm like, no, we've been, we have been allotted money so that we can defend our cases and hold our values um, if we feel strongly that, we've, that they're correct. So I appreciate being able to um, keep that $20,000 in there even though we haven't had to uh, use too much of it. If you just have to get one appellate tax board case and have to pay twelve thousand dollars for an appraisal, and you know I'd be scrambling if we didn't have any money in the budget to be able to do that, or it would put me in a much different position for negotiating um, uh, the the values. Our training and conference already spoke to that. Printing and binding, um, we have to bind our commitment book every year. That's a permanent record for us, so that covers that. Um, office supplies has stayed the same, and our um, subscriptions and dues. That, again, I wanted to thank you. Um, a few years back, we had asked for money to um, 
get a subscription to what's called CoStar. And it's um, an online commercial real estate service that documents um, all of the commercial sales. So it gives me information um, of rents, like true ownership types of properties, what the type of the sale was on all the large commercial properties. It gives us um, cap rates. It gives us regional vacancy rates on our industrial properties, office buildings. So it's it's fantastic resource for us to have. And I will just say that um, in December, we had a flurry of um, large industrial sales that took place and it allowed us to um, go online and use that resource to find out who was the actual true buyers behind some of these um, deals. And just to share with you, we had um, up on Ballardville Street, number 230, 234, 240, and 220 Ballardville Street. They're all like flex commercial uh, warehouse slash office buildings. They sold for $55 million. Down on Industrial Way, um, number 80 Industrial Way, it was a court case that we had at one time. And uh, they told us how they'd never be able to sell it because it was contaminated. That just sold for $72 million um, in, in December. Uh, there was the combination that that particular um, company owned five properties on Industrial Way and one on Woburn Street. They sold for a total of $132 million. Um, also on Ballardville Street, we had number 299, 300 and 301, and those just sold for $47.8 million in December. Um, the, there's a, a company called, um, it was what's the name of them? Oh, Atlantic Oliver. And when we go on to CoStar, Atlantic Oliver is actually, um, the true owner is Bain Capital. And uh, Bain Capital is one of the world's leading private investment firms with like $75 billion in assets. So they are, um, they bought about 10 properties in Wilmington in December. So the fact that their eyes are on our community and they're paying very large money for this warehouse and flex type space, I think um, it speaks, speaks volumes, but that subscription is covered under this line item that helps us with, with that information um, to research, you know, was this a portfolio sale? Is it really arm's length or what was included, et cetera. So that is um, pretty much my budget in a nutshell, we're just hoping to be able to get back doing um, more interior inspections. Our biggest challenge has been really to be able to do interiors. I've done um, virtual inspections with people. I'm, I'm doing the interiors on all new construction, um, but uh, virtual inspections, you know, Zoom or um, FaceTime with people and walk through their home and turn here, look here, go to the attic, go to the basement, all the nooks and crannies. So it takes a little bit longer but we've been able to um, accomplish it. So at the end of the day, I also want to say, I know you're always um, concerned about, you're, you have a very big role in setting the budget and we're always focused on people's uh, average tax bill and the um, impact of what you're all doing at the, at the end result. So I would just say that um, this year, if, if you had seen the classification hearing was one of the lowest tax increase years. So the residential average residential value or bill only went up $144, which is the lowest it's been in several years. And I'm happy to say so far, even though I know it's not over because uh, February 2nd isn't here yet when it's the application deadline due date, but uh, to date commercial and residential, we only have 11 abatement applications of which four are residential. So Fingers crossed, um, <laughs> it doesn't go up more than that. But at the end of the day, all your efforts to uh, keep taxes, you know, where they should be is as um, working or as helpful so far, I hope. Uh, to, you know, looking forward, one of the things that did help us this year was um, the shift, the percent shift that went to the commercial class versus residential. So that in and of itself did help with um, lowering the residential uh, bill a little bit. And with looking at some of the new growth projects that are coming online, anything that's an apartment building or housing goes into the residential class. So um, when our residential value growth is gonna outweigh our commercial industrial, we end up seeing that tip back again, like earlier in the budget book where it showed what percent of the uh, taxes are 
make up residential versus commercial. I think that was back at um, page six, I believe. Um, in the, yeah, on page seven, actually. So you can see the residential value made up 59.87%, but they actually, um, I'm sorry, their value made up 77%, but they actually ended up paying only 59.02%, which was less than the previous year. So that helped keep the residential value down. The new growth for this coming year, um, I think is gonna be a little bit less. I think 22 is, is going to be less based upon what we've seen and kind of what happened um, during 20, like what projects are in the pipeline. But I did have a long conversation with Val today and uh, trying to estimate what project she thinks will be done by June 30th this year. Um, some of them won't even be off the ground and some of them, you know, maybe the ground breaking will start, but not too much in the way of anything large. We do still have some of our subdivisions, our um, Hensi Way, which is the over 55 condo project. We still have about 11 units up there that we haven't assessed yet because again, our assessment date was June 30th. Um, we also have still about five left over at Green Meadow. Murray Hill is finished, but we do have, um, you know, the project on Lowell Street. There's going to be 36 condos there. However, that will be phased, so it will be a phased project. Um, you have Hopkins Street, which is going to be another 17 single-family houses. They've started uh, putting in roadways there. We do have on Eames Street, there is a um, 44,000 square foot warehouse going to be going in there. Every year until the TIF agreement is finished, um, analog will, 5% of their um, value will be added. And there is um, the Middlesex Ave, let's see, oh, Jefferson, Middlesex Ave and Jefferson across from Eli's, that um, they are close to getting their final um, uh, permits in order so that Val felt once they um, received their permits that they would be moving quickly on getting rid of the buildings that are there and starting their construction. And that's gonna be 108 apartments. So you know, I would, I would say that would be, probably be about a 22 to $25 million um, value. Again, that's gonna get dumped into the residential class. So it looks like fiscal year 23, all these projects would probably be well under the way. Um, I'm just not sure for fiscal 22, how much will be accomplished um, in the next like four or five months before um, June 30th assessment date. So I just, that's kind of a little side note, but just to touch on the um, growth questions that had come up earlier. Thank you, any questions for Karen? Yeah, I, I do. Uh, for Karen, uh, what's going on up to it, on Middlesex Avenue where the uh, rehab place was gonna go? Is that now going forward or is there something else going on there? Um, so I, I think that would be best to speak to that, but I did ask her today about that. She can give you more details. Um, I was there, I was across the street doing a different inspection earlier in the week and um, I saw the excavators working and she said that, uh, yes, they are now moving forward. So I mean, to me, that would be kind of like medical office building as far as valuation, but I, I believe it's proceeding forward. Hmm. Apparently... We lost the court case. <laughs> uh, Jeff, maybe you know more about that. I, I'm i not sure of all the details of how that came out. At the end uh, yeah, of I mean, so ultimately there was, um, uh, it, you know, went to the Board of Appeals uh, and uh, the <laughs> Board of Appeals uh, initially denied uh, the permit uh, by uh, the company for the... Um, a detox center, they uh, were pursuing an appeal uh, and, and ultimately uh, we had counsel, special counsel involved. This kind of goes back to the issue of impact on insurance because of course we had to bring in insurance counsel. But long and the short of it was uh, that there was a, an agreement to send it back, the case back to the um, Board of Appeals and they uh, uh, found in favor of the uh, applicant and so um, that is why the project is going forward. Okay. Any other questions for Karen? See you then, thank you. Uh, next. 
Uh, let's see, I think we may be, oh, actually, uh, so we've got town council. I did want to note uh, town council, uh, we're looking at uh, a reduction there uh, of $50,000. Um, and uh, as you can see, just um, looking at the budget book on page 31, uh, you'll see the fiscal uh, 19 expenditures, uh, 224056 uh, fiscal uh, 20186 uh, 138 0035 we we have seen a um, a decline in our uh, expenditures on legal counsel i am being somewhat conservative and not wanting to dial it all the way back so to speak but uh, you know previously we were at 285 and it seemed reasonable uh, given our history here uh, to be able to reduce that number to 235 uh, that, that includes both uh, town council, which is uh, KP law, uh, and also special counsel for the Olin uh, project and uh, New England Transrail, uh, which is Dan Deutsch uh, from uh, Brooks and Dorensis. So um, in, in both cases, the uh, expenses have been moderating. So that's a good sign. Anybody have any questions for... Uh... Jeff or Kerry or anyone else? I do. Uh, Jeff, what's um, you spoke a little bit about Textron um, last night. Can you just bring us up to date on what's going on over there? Uh, yes. Uh, so there was a, uh, I was invited to participate in a meeting back in August, I believe it was, uh, with representative from representatives from Textron. And I think also on that call, uh, I believe it was Valerie Gingrich and some other staff, but they announced at that time that uh, they uh, had a potential buyer uh, for some of their property. They didn't announce at that time who it was, but uh, it was clear that they were looking to uh, sell uh, a portion of their property. It's actually, I believe, around 61.7 acres uh, on that campus. Uh, and uh, so they... Um, you know, essentially suggested it in a very, in very, very favorable terms that, you know, they had decided to stay in Wilmington because for the last few years, they've uh, looked at a number of options, one of which included moving uh, to another community, ultimately decided to stay in Wilmington uh, and uh, essentially downsize. Uh, they basically left that meeting or that um, Zoom session indicating that they would be back in touch with us when uh, they were um, further along in terms of conversations with this potential buyer. Uh, we had another session here back on January 12th, as I recall, uh, and uh, the, they announced that National Development, uh, which is a fairly large scale uh, developer uh, that is based in Newton, uh, is the uh, potential uh, buyer of this uh, portion of this property. I believe it's about 35 acres. Um, and they're looking to um, develop the property for warehousing and distribution. Uh, Textron is looking to, as I say, um, move uh, out of the remaining buildings they're in and consolidate into one building, it's so-called building nine. They are actually, as, as I'm told, uh, increasing their complement of employees. Apparently they've been able to be more successful at getting some contracts from the federal government. So they're hiring engineers and uh, technical people, uh, but principally uh, they're looking to offload uh, a good portion of the property, uh, including in that the uh, property where the ball courts, uh, tennis courts and ball fields are, uh, and uh, they are, so some, some of the issues that we raised during the course of that conversation uh, were obviously concerns about traffic because we are on um, the state's uh, transportation improvement plan uh, for work on the Lowell Street, uh, Woburn Street intersection. Um, it is slated to be 2024, <clears throat> could actually be moved up to two, 2023 uh, and that did not contemplate, obviously, this, uh, this kind of a development. So one of the questions that was posed on our end is, you know, what are the impacts going to be uh, with regard to traffic? 
they indicated that they plan to use both access to Main Street as well as Lowell Street. Uh, you know, I think it still remains to be seen and we'll want to get information from them if they ultimately go forward uh, as to how much traffic is going to uh, impact. Uh, it's my understanding they are slated to, they being uh, National Development and Textron, uh, to enter a um, purchase and sale uh, by the end of the month. Uh, and then uh, National Development will have uh, some due diligence time between then in uh, March, and then ultimately decide whether they want to go forward. Um, you know, one of the things I think has been pretty well known for, for many people is that the town has been very interested in the uh, tennis courts and the ball fields. Uh, in fact, I've had many conversations, uh, just in, according to the, my notes, as far back as July of 2015, and I think it may even go back further, um, having conversations with uh, some of their prior general managers and more recent general managers, and then most recently with uh, a real estate representative out of their Rhode Island office, you know, expressing interest in the property. Uh, in each case where I've uh, inquired about it, they've, uh, the representatives from Textron have stated that they don't wanna carve off a piece of the property. They wanna maintain it in whole, which I guess is ultimately what they're planning to do here. Uh, during this last conversation, uh, it was indicated that uh, national development has no immediate plans for the uh, tennis court and uh, ball field area. Uh, and there was a kind of a broad statement that, you know, they would work with the town in terms of, uh, I guess, access to the, the uh, tennis courts and ball fields, but there was no specificity as to what that means. Very interesting. Any questions for uh, for Jeff on the subject? Seeing none. What do we have next, Jeff? So that's it for the budget side, right? Yes. And did you want to? I don't know if there's any people on uh, under public comment or. That's what I was just going to ask John. Do we have anyone on on the line or? We do not. You do not. Okay. So, anyone else have Jeff, any questions? Is there? Can we get a um? Print out of what Chief Kavanaugh went over with the CARES Act, how much we spent and how much he's um, recovered back. Yes, I, I'll uh, get that for you. Thank you. Other than that, um, I think the next item is um, minutes from June 9th and June 11th. Has everyone got the revised ones that Chris sent out? Has everyone read them? Never seen them. Okay. okay. I'd, I'd, enter, I'd entertain a motion for um, June 9th. So moved. Okay. Second. Okay. Second. Okay. Uh, uh, John, you, you, I was going to have them say their name yeah. when, they, when, when they do do it, please. And then uh, as a vote, it'll be a roll call vote. Okay. So, Marianne, do you want to? Yep, Marianne's going to go ahead and um, accept the minutes as written. Okay. John will go ahead and second them. Okay. Um, all those in favor, I'll do a roll call. Bernie? Yes. Teresa? Teresa? Uh, she's muted. She's muted, okay. We're voting on the minutes. It's roll call. Yes, I hear you. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. That's okay. Y Any yes. Voting? Okay. Um, Kevin? Yes. Okay. Marianne? Yes. And John? Yes. And myself, yes. Okay, passes. Next is entertain a motion for the minutes of June 11th. I make a motion that we accept the minutes of June 11th as revised. And you have to state your name. I'm sorry, Teresa Manganelli. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second it, Marianne Galezzo. Okay, let's, um, all in favor, uh, roll call. Bernie? Teresa Manganelli, aye. 
Okay. Bernie Nelly. Aye. Yeah. Kevin. Yes. Marianne. Yes. John. Also yes. And I'll say yes as well. So it passes. We have one item left, and that is the reorganization of the committee. I'll um, uh, enter. Uh, anyone wants to make a motion for? Uh, Teresa we'll McAnally will make a motion to um, have John Doherty as chairman. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay, Bernie Nelly. Nelly. Okay. Um, any others? We'll do a roll call vote. Bernie Nelly. We're on voting. Who'd you, who'd, you, who'd you mention? I'm not sure. You. You. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes. <laughs> Teresa. Yes. Kevin. Yes. John. Yes. Marianne. Yes. Thank you. I appreciate it. Next is for vice chairman. I'll entertain a motion um, for vice chairman. Teresa McAnally. Mary Ann Galizzo, okay. Um, is there a second? Is there a second? Kevin Stokes. Okay. okay. Um, <laughs> do a roll call vote then. Uh, Bernie, Nelly? Aye. Okay, Mary Ann? Yes. John Dugas? Yes. Kevin Stokes? Yes. Myself, yes. Teresa, congratulations. Thank you. Next is for um, secretary. Entertain a motion for a secretary. Who's our current secretary? Michelle. No. Yeah, Michelle. Then I'll make a motion that um, Michelle be appointed as secretary. Okay, Teresa Manganelli made the motion. Is there a second? Do we want to ask her before we dominate her? <laughs> Too late. Oh. <laughs> this is a gift for missing a meeting. <laughs> John Dugas, John Dugas <laughs> seconded. Um, we'll do a roll call vote then. Bernie Nelly? Aye. Okay. Uh, Marianne Galiza? Yes. Okay. John Dugas? Yes. Okay. Um, Teresa Manganelli? Yes. Kevin Stokes? Yes. And I'll say yes as well, so it passes. Okay. Jeff, do you want anything else? Uh, Jeff, if you can hear us, it looks like you have not joined audio. Uh, I don't know if there's a message about joining with computer audio. Um, otherwise, you can hover over the bottom left of the Zoom window, and there should be a microphone that would allow you to click and um, join with your computer audio. He looks frozen also. Does look frozen. He yeah, does. Yeah. Fun. Okay. Um, seeing. Does anyone else have anything else to make a comment or anything else? Seeing none. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Marion Galezo, motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Teresa Magnelli, no second. Roll call vote. Bernie. Nelly. Aye. Okay. Marianne. Galezo. Yes. John Dugas. Yes. Kevin Stokes. Yes. Teresa Manganelli? Yes. I'll vote yes. Meeting's adjourned. We'll see everyone on Thursday. Enjoy the rest Hi, of your night, guys. Right. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thursday. Thank care. you. Have a good night. Good night. Thank good night. you. Good night.